All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Cliff Cackline uh, Cooperstown Upstate New York Sabre meeting. Uh, this isn't really a meeting tonight. This is going to be a presentation. This is going to 100% focus on the career and life of um, Cliff Cackline, whose our chapter is actually named after. And I'll just give a quick backdrop of how this came about. So um, the Cooperstown chapter has uh, one of their meetings, um, Hall of Fame induction weekend, which is very unique because you know, a lot of writers, a lot of players uh, are in town. So they hold a, a unique meeting. And this year, the meeting was, uh, the inductions were initially going to be July 25th. And as everybody knows, that got postponed till September. But one of our members, Bill Dean, had pointed out earlier in the year that uh, serendipitously, uh, July 25th was going to mark the 100th anniversary of the birth of Cliff. So we decided to go forward with a meeting, even though there was no Hall of Fame inductions. And much to my surprise, a week or two ahead of the meeting, I received uh, an email from Joyce Thomas, one of Cliff's daughters, who asked if she could come say a few words about her dad. And of course, we were that's exactly what we were hoping for. And I'm going to let a few people in here. And um, so she came that night, did a, a really great presentation, and we felt it was a shame that there was only a few dozen people there to view it. So we thought we would redo it. So she's agreed to come on tonight. Um, she's got lots of Cliff's family who I think might jump in with some stories. And we're going to encourage anybody that has stories or dealings with Cliff over the years to you know, be welcome to, to jump in and, and share, share your memories. So... Um, we are recording, Joyce. I am going to turn it over to you. Awesome. And before I get started, I'm going to ask if everybody would please mute your microphone. Um, and so my bird doesn't hear you <laughs> because she will try to react to it. And I apologize if my dog barks. I was hoping she was going to go to sleep, but she's unfortunately awake and active right now. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. <clears throat> This past summer, the Cliff Cackline Cooperstown chapter of Sabre held their traditional post Hall of Fame induction meeting on what would have been my father's 100th birthday. Unfortunately, due to COVID, the induction ceremonies were delayed a few months, but a group of Sabre members gathered for their meeting that day, and I was invited to speak about my dad. In this 2010 tribute to Cliff Cackline, Mark Armour wrote, not many people will know a subject so well during their lifetime that they will be referred to as a walking encyclopedia by their colleagues. But that is what Cliff Cackline was to baseball. My dad was deeply involved in sports through writing, collecting sports memorabilia, and almost everything else connected with sports, most especially baseball, for more than half a century. He had one of the largest private collections of books covering all of the major sports, from biographies to fiction to statistics and everything in between. He collected them. He bought them at the library, at library sales. He bought them at uh, online in a lot of different ways. I'm Cliff's daughter, Joyce Thomas. His words and wisdom, both Pennsylvania Dutch and English, and his delight in malapropisms, have woven themselves into the entire course of my lifetime and continue to have impact today as we celebrate his 100th birthday. Bits of Clifford still pass for me through to the industrial design students that I teach at Auburn University, and also through his grandchildren onto his great-grandchildren and all those that he touched on his journey through life. When my dad passed in 2010, there were lots of online tributes. My family pulled all of these memorials written about him together into a printed document that we called Cliff's Notes. Some of the words here tonight come from a biography that my dad wrote in August of 2008 some from stories that he told across his lifetime, and especially in the last four years after my mom's death, when he lived half the year with me in Illinois and half the year with my sister, Jerry, in Georgia. 
There's also stories written in 2001 from one of his dear friends, Bob Oboiski, a fellow Sabre member and prolific author who covered baseball, coin and stamp collecting, and memorabilia, all of my dad's passions. I'm going to tell you about his entire life, from his birth to his death, his family, and his career as a professional sports writer, PR director for US professional soccer, historian of the Baseball Hall of Fame, and founder and executive director for the Society for American Baseball Research. Cliff was born in Quakertown, PA. This slide shows the 15th census of the United States from 1930 for Bucks County, second ward of Quakertown, PA. If you have really good eyes, you can see that Clifford is listed as eight years old here. What great old family photos. I feel so lucky that we have these. His mother, Florence, was a professional seamstress. Here in this stern looking Pennsylvania Dutch family is his father, Hiram. Now, you all probably know that in the old days of photography, you couldn't smile because it took such a long exposure to be able to get them. But I have to believe that this family looked like this most of the time. This is just the way we are. <laughs> so if you knew my dad, you would recognize that his father, Hiram, and he have great resemblance to each other. Hiram and Florence both worked in clothing factories in the area. Hiram was a presser, and I believe Florence worked on the sleeves and collars. Grammy Kay, who is what we had called her, was a fabulous seamstress, leaving a legacy for all of her children and grandchildren through her beautiful handmade quilts. Cliff was the oldest of five siblings. His parents look so young in these photos. I would guess that they're probably around 21 and 23, not sure. These images are from the photo album my mother Evelyn put together and they include her handwriting, which still gives me really warm feelings every time that I look at it. She was the historian the keeper of the records in the family in the years, early years of their marriage. 100 years ago, the country was in really pretty good shape, but then came the stock market crash in 1929. And so Clifford and all of his siblings grew up during the Great Depression. This really shaped his penchant for thrift his entire life. He really knew how to stretch a nickel. He counted everything, including steps, long before there was such a thing as a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. And he was a stickler for getting the numbers and the facts straight. He kept a ledger from the time he earned his first nickel, writing down everything that he earned and everything that he spent, requiring my mom to do the same until the day he died. And at that time when my sister and I looked at his wallet and he had his record in his wallet, it was off by less than a couple of dollars. We laughed at that. We thought it was hilarious, but it would have driven him nuts. What adventures these young brothers must have had. I always find this image amusing. Was it in vogue those days? to take a photo of your children's portraits, their school photos. I suppose that the cost of copies from the photographer may have been prohibitive for many families. And so this is how they documented them. Doesn't Clifford look handsome in this suit? I love this story dad told me. When Cliff was in his late teens, his mom Florence took one of Hiram's old worn wool suits apart. She turned the fabric inside out where the fabric was new and reconstructed it to fit Clifford. I don't know if it's this suit. Maybe it was this suit. Apparently Hiram was so impressed with the new suit that he asked Florence to remake it in his size again. She declined. 
Cliff graduated from Quakertown High School in 1939. He was fifth in the class of 105 students. Yet he never took home his books to study or read during his senior year. He never did homework. He spent a lot of his time in the high school library, searching through almanacs and encyclopedias, searching for baseball information. Cliff was definitely a baseball nut. That's how he described himself. The words he used at the end of his career to describe himself in his youth. With the US just emerging from the Great Depression, Cliff headed directly into the workforce following high school. He wound up working at the local Eccles Cigar Box factory. And there he spent nearly a year feeding cigar boxes into a machine that pressed the paper liners in place. In his autobiography, he wrote, the job paid 25 cents an hour or 12.50 for a 50 hour week. In July, 1940, apparently taking a pay cut to pursue his real passion, Cliff began his writing career as a $7 a week printer's apprentice, printer's apprentice and writer for his hometown weekly, the Quakertown Free Press. Shortly after taking the job, he almost lost his right hand in a printing press accident. Some of the medical personnel recommended amputating his hand, but a Dr. Cackline, who was likely a distant relative, according to my dad, felt that he could save it, and they did. Those were the days before medical, the medical profession understood the importance of hand washing, which we all know the importance of these days. Cliff contracted typhoid fever in the hospital and that delayed his recovery quite a bit. He spent most of the time of 1941 running errands for the free press and attending an art school in Philadelphia several days a week. Art runs in our family. Despite winding up with a stiff and really pretty crooked right hand, he quickly learned to type rapidly and accurately, those are his words, on the manual typewriters of the day. He perfected a th three finger method with his right hand. Once again, pursuing his passion for sports, he became a full-time correspondent the following summer for a nearby daily paper, the Bethlehem Globe Times. In the fall of 1942, at age 21, he was named the sports editor of the North Penn Reporter a daily paper in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Meantime, he had become enchanted, his words, with the sporting news. Now, when you say that name, people who know and love baseball say something like, oh yes, I know that paper. At the time, the sporting news was a weekly newspaper published in St. Louis and only covered professional baseball, but all of it. Early in 1940, the Sporting News carried an advertisement promoting the first edition of its brand new baseball register. The ad showed the year-by-year -year stats of two prominent players as they were to appear in the register. <laughs> With his sharp eye and his penchant for getting the numbers right, Cliff noticed three mistakes in the record of one player, Frank McCormick, the 1939 National League MVP. And he dashed off a letter to J.G. Taylor Spink in hopes that the errors could be corrected before publication. Within a matter of days, Spink wrote back to ask if Cliff would be interested in proofreading the entire register. He jumped at the opportunity and he soon received a huge packaging carrying, uh, containing these really long galley proofs of the major and minor league career records of 400 players, yikes. With the book due to go to press, he had only a week to check the material. Impressed with Clifford's attention to detail, Spink asked him again the following winter to check the records. This time armed with a copy of Who's Who in Baseball and other sources, Cliff spent four weeks at his kitchen, family's kitchen table with the help of his mother, Florence, comparing and reviewing the latest proofs and correcting many errors and typos. Early in April, 1943, 
J.G. Taylor Spink invited Cliff to come to St. Louis to work full-time at the Sporting News. So after only five months in that dream role as the sports editor of the North Penn Reporter, Cliff hopped on the train and moved halfway across the country to join the Sporting News in St. Louis. He met Evelyn, who would later become his wife, at the church he attended through their Young People's Club and also through the, the choir. Cliff was a choir master and he had a wonderful tenor voice. Cliff was a young eligible bachelor with a rising career in sports writing. Evelyn was a brilliant elementary school teacher with a great group of friends. One of my favorite stories as a kid was that dad who was always late for everything actually was late to his own wedding. And so in my preteen years, it was really delightful to conspire with my mom and my sister whenever we had plans to go somewhere and tell them that it was five or 10 minutes later than the act time actually was so that we wouldn't all be late. Cliff and Evelyn bought their first and only home in South St. Louis in 1949, and they soon started their family. There's lots of photos of my sister as a baby, but when I came along three years later, the novelty of the camera had worn off. I mostly don't show up in the family album until I was older, but I actually did find these photos of me when I was pretty young. We were definitely a baseball family. Like my sister, I went to my first professional baseball game to see the Cardinals play on their home opening day of the season when I was six months old. They lost to the Cubs four to 13. I had to Google that. I could have asked Cliff if he were here and he might've remembered it <laughs> because he was an encyclopedia, you know. Many of our family summer vacations included visiting dad's family in Pennsylvania and traveling to baseball destinations where Cliff would meet other sports colleagues. We made our first sojourn to Cooperstown in the early 60s. It was always about baseball. My sister and I went to at least one game every time the Cardinals played at home. We always had a dress in our Sunday best because we had the sporting news seats. Dad would give us enough change for each of us to get a soda and a popcorn or peanuts, but never, never enough for a hot dog, Cracker Jacks, or ice cream. While he watched the game from the, sport, from the press box, where he often enjoyed a buffet from a local restaurant. I told him I wanted to grow up to be a sports writer and sit in the press box too. And he replied back to me that women were not allowed in the press box and I should consider another profession. Apparently he had taken my sister to the press box at some point, maybe before I was born, and that wasn't received well. Remember, this is long before Take Your Daughter to Work Day came about. She remembers that he told her she was the first female to be there in the press box. He did live to see women working in the press box and as sports broadcasters, but he missed out on the first female major league officials. Cliff could really make this old Underwood typewriter sing. And as kids, my sister and I learned to type on this beauty that I still own today. He began collecting the sport, sporting news as a teenager and he purchased a lifetime subscription for I don't know, something like $8, I don't know, it was really small, well before he joined the staff of the Sporting News. Later, after he left the Sporting News, he had a fight to keep that lifetime subscription going. And you know what? They did honor it, even past his death for a while. For nearly a quarter century, Cliff wrote countless stories, features, news articles, both credited and uncredited for the Sporting News. By the early 1950s, his byline began appearing on the front page news stories, as well as on features on the inside pages. His primary task during the baseball season 
was writing and editing coverage of the three highest minor leagues, the American Association, the International League, and the Pacific Coast League. In the off season from October to mid-April, he covered the winter leagues operating in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Venezuela, and others. That sounds pretty exciting, but he covered them from St. Louis where he corresponded with Latin American sports writers and rewrote their stories from box scores. It was this correspondence that contributed to his passion for collecting stamps. The mail flow brought many cool stamps to our house. My sister and I remember the stamp parties that we had, uh, soaking the stamps off envelopes in trays of water on the radiator in our dining room. Cliff did get to travel to Cuba for a baseball writers convention before the US travel to Cuba was restricted. My sister remembers that mom did not get to go, so he brought her home some white dove skin gloves. He was also responsible for helping cover the annual minor and major league meetings that happened in December. In these images, he was traveling to Washington DC, but there were lots of other locations as well. Additionally, Cliff compiled and wrote most of the prose carried in the annual official baseball guide, the baseball dope book, baseball register, naughty problems, and others. These annuals are now collector's items, and it doesn't take anyone with an online search engine very long to find that vintage editions in good shape sell at many, many times their cover price. The sporting news guides of that period are now considered classics. In the mid 1960s, Cliff served a two year ter term as president of the St. Louis chapter of the Baseball Writers Association of America. He was the first sporting news staff member ever to hold that position. And he was a lifetime member of the Baseball Writers Association of America of America, that's hard to say. <laughs> and he continued to vote for the players going into the Baseball Hall of Fame right up until he died. In May 1967, professional soccer made its debut in the US. Cliff left the sporting news to become the public relations promotions director for the newly formed United Soccer Association, which was headquartered in New York City. The league had franchises backed by owners of several major league baseball clubs, the Houston Astros, Chicago White Sox, and Cleveland Indians, as well as sports entrepreneurs Lamar Hunt and Jack Kent Cook. By midsummer, the Cackline family had settled into a home in New Jersey, an hour's train ride from his office in downtown Manhattan, where he had a great new electric typewriter. In the winter of 1967 to 68, the league merged with the, with the rival National Professional Soccer League, who had two major league baseball operated franchises, uh, Atlanta Braves and Baltimore Orioles, and had also just finished its first season. They became the North American Soccer League, NASL. At the close of the 68 summer season, several of the soccer teams called it quits because of financial losses. And after two seasons, it folded and Cliff found himself on the job market. According to dad's autobiography, during the winter of 68, 69, the longtime number two executive in the baseball commissioner's office sought to add Cliff to the staff in some capacity but that effort was scuttled by a sudden change in commissioners. And that was when Bowie Kuhn took that role. So during that time frame, he did some freelance work for his very good friend, Seymour Siwoff, the master of sports statistics and the owner and president of the Elias Sports Bureau. When Lee Allen, historian of the Baseball Hall of Fame and another good friend of my dad, died in May 1969, the Hall President Paul Kerr contacted the former baseball commissioner Ford Frick for his recommendation for someone to fill the position. Frick recommended Cackling. And so we moved to Cooperstown in 1969. 
Dad's office was in the National Baseball Library, just one long block from our home. The library was a freestanding building that was just a year old. The Hall of Fame and the museum were considerably smaller than what they are today. And the museum and the, the exhibits in the museum were really, really antiquated. The Hall of Fame had just 11 full-time employees. Oboiski wrote, the Hall of Fame historian posts wielded considerable influence through the entire baseball community because Cackline possessed a strong personality and an encyclopedic knowledge of the sport, he helped to make the position more significant than ever before. A side note about this great jacket Clifford's wearing. He loved the loud plaids that the baseball folks were wearing during this era. I'm pretty sure that this is the jacket that my mother made for him. The contacts that he had developed with many baseball officials during his years at the Sporting News proved of immense benefit to the Hall of Fame. This is Bob Bragg at the right edge of the photograph, partially cut off. He was a well-known sports writer in St. Louis. And of course, this is Hank Aaron, who needs no introduction. During his first year at the Hall, Cliff realized that many major league teams were storing historically valuable material such as correspondence, contracts, financial records, old publications, and that this material might eventually be disposed of by the teams. So he wrote to all 26 clubs suggesting that the hall would be interested in looking over such material and salvaging important items for the Hall of Fame archives. Among his acquisitions were major and minor league baseball player cards dating back to 1902, from Cincinnati when they were moving from Crosley Field to the new Rivers Front Stadium. It also included Yankees financial ledgers on these five by seven cards from the 1920s and 30s. This is Babe Ruth's 1921 contract card with a salary of 40,000. And there were also historic documents from the files of the commissioner's office. Wojcicki quoted my dad saying, with all the materials we found on those scavenging expeditions and those donated by various clubs and the commissioner's office, the Hall of Fame library grew into an enormous collection of valuable source material, such as team yearbooks, roster guides, World Series programs, World Series films, photographs, old scorecards, documents, and similar items and almost all has been liberally used by researchers. This might have been one of my dad's favorite parts of the job, working with and helping researchers of all sorts, including players and umpires, find data in the library. Even after he left employment at the hall, he returned to the library frequently and would sidle up to people and offer to help. This was really one of his joys. An indication of the respect with which baseball officials had for Kekline was exhibited when he was asked to serve as editor for the official World Series program. Prior to 1974, each World Series team produced their own program, but with expansion of teams and the divisional playoffs, there were occasions when there were more than eight clubs th that were in the running for the series and they spent considerable time and money preparing a program only to fail to reach the series. So to eliminate the wasted efforts, it was agreed that the commissioner's office would handle the production of the series programs. Cliff served, served as editor from 1974 to 1977. Here's Evelyn and Cliff standing near the Sam Lott kid sculpture at Doubleday Field in Cooperstown. He sure loved that jacket. Seems like we never caught him in photos in any of the other five or six loud plaids that he had. Another tribute to Cackline's abilities and dedication came late in 1979, a dozen years after he'd left the Sporting News, the publisher called to inquire whether he would again write the lengthy review of the year 
that he had made an important feature of the official baseball guide when he was the editor. Cliff's accounts appeared in the guides of 1980 through 1991. W.P. Kinsella came to the National Baseball Library and worked through some of his research with Cliff for his book, Shoeless Joe, which was published in 1982. Dad was cited in the book, and the book was, of course, the basis for the movie Field of Dreams. Dad was also hired, he served, and credited as technical advisor for the movie. Cliff was at the Hall of Fame for nearly 14 years before being dismissed at the end of October 1982 in what Bill Madden, prominent New York Daily News baseball writer, termed a surprise move that reeks of in-house politics. Sports Illustrated also did an article on this incident. In his book, The Politics of Glory, How the Baseball Hall of Fame Really Works, Bill James devoted an entire chapter to Cliff's tenure as a Hall of Fame historian. Obojski wrote that in 1982, shortly after Cliff's forced exodus from the Hall of Fame, he sent an open two-page letter addressed to the commissioner, league presidents, general managers, PR directors, and other interested parties. Detailing events that led up to his dismissal, the strongly worded letter concluded with this statement. If all of this has you puzzled, you can appreciate my bafflement. After 40 years of close association with baseball, dating from my start with the sporting news in 1943, developments at the Baseball Hall of Fame have left me wondering whether the best interests of baseball are always being served. The grief and bitterness these political moves from the Hall of Fame management caused in both my mom and dad stayed with them for the rest of their lives. Obojski wrote, since Cackline's departure, the title of Hall of Fame historian has also disappeared. Functions of that office are now spread out among several members of the Hall of Fame staff. So stepping back in history a little bit, in August of 1971, 16 baseball aficionados, 16, including Cliff, and led by Bob Davids, gathered in the Hall of Fame library as founders of the Society for American Baseball Research, with a goal to foster the study of baseball as a significant American social and athletic institution. 11 years later, by the end of 1982, Sabre membership had risen to 1,800, and the board of directors decided that a full-time paid administrator was required. Early in 1983, Cliff accepted the newly created position of the executive director of Sabre. In his three years there before retiring, he saw the membership climb to 6,200. This was a family passion. Evelyn Cackline, my mom, handled the Sabre financial records and membership roles from 1975 through 1985. In 2011, citing the indelible mark on the world of baseball research made by Cliff Cackline, Sabre presented him the Henry Chadwick Award. If I could ask everybody to mute their computers, we're picking up some background sound. Thank you. This was established in November 2009 to honor baseball's great researchers, historians, statisticians, analysts, and archivists for their invaluable contributions to making baseball the game that links America's present with its past. Cliff's passion for and his contacts within the game helped countless researchers over the years, and he was helping them right up to his death in 2010. Clifford was a stickler for the exactness 
of baseball records and the exactness of all records. And he doggedly worked to get records corrected from Rube Waddell's 1904 strikeout total to Hack Wilson's 1930 RBI uh, figure. And here he's pointing this out at the Hall of Fame. Obojski quoted data saying, you'd be surprised at the number of mistakes that official scorers make when they turn in their score sheets. Lots of times they're under deadline pressure to complete those score sheets and they don't bother to check out all the key st stats. Here's Cliff with one of his many friends in baseball, sport, sports broadcaster, Jack Buck. Over a 57 year period from 1943 to 1999, Cliff attended 150 World Series games and 24 All-Star baseball games many of them with my mom at his side. Cliff's baseball memorabilia included a wonderful collection of pins and press credentials from all of those games and other more historical ones that he had acquired. My sister, planning with my dad, created beautiful shadow boxes for each of his grandchildren with a portion of his collection. My mom passed in the fall of 2006. Dad continued living at his Cooperstown house on his own, but he had never learned to cook. He could boil water. No, I don't think he could even boil water. Mom always left a can of soup out on the counter for him with the, the uh, can opener. And he thought adding milk to the soup instead of water made him a chef. <laughs> His lack of ability to cook, along with his Pennsylvania Dutch stoic unspoken grief, took a toll on his health, especially when his chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL, came out of remission. At Christmas that year, he came to visit me in Illinois, and he ended up staying for the next eight months as we battled the CLL back into remission. This was the start of his living back and forth between my home and my sister's home in Georgia, for the next four years. With a full wardrobe at each house and also at the Cooperstown house, he could get on the plane with his laptop and an extra pair of shoes and head to his summer or winter home. Here he's just arrived at the Central Illinois Regional Airport and is chatting with the sculpture of Adelaide Stevenson. Whether he was in Illinois or Georgia, he thrived on being a part of everything that went on in our households, including college events, graduations. My daughter and I both graduated in 2009 to weddings and to family celebrations with his siblings and his grandchildren. He reached out to his friends and colleagues around the country, talking to several of them by phone each week. He kept a log, of course he kept a log, right, to make sure that he touched all of his friends. I'm not sure how much talking they did. There weren't too many pauses in his conversations when I could hear his side of it. And almost always they ended up with, well, I guess I've spent my nickel. Talk to you again. These might have been the original podcasts, or certainly Cliff's Notes, earning him the nickname Mr. DJ from one of my graduate school classmates as he shared the goings on of our lives with all of his friends across the country. And using the Sabre online access to the Sporting News collection, he went back and read every story he had ever written. When I asked him if he'd saved them for us to read afterwards, he nonchalantly shrugged and it was enough for him that he had revisited them. He didn't care whether we ever saw them or not. We visited Cooperstown every summer in those four years where he enjoyed greeting tourists on Main Street and asking them about their journey and also visiting the hall and the library. A promise made by me apparently in 1969 when we moved to Cooperstown to my St. Louis grade school boyfriend, Ed Schumer, for a tour of the Hall of Fame archives was finally realized 40 years later 
after we had reconnected in 2008. Ed had a high-level career in college D1 officiating, both basketball and baseball, and he was especially interested in seeing the caps worn by some of his friends and mentors. In 2009, Tim Wiles, who was then director of research for the hall and a good friend to my dad, invited Cliff to tell his story, saying something like, we've done a really great job at keeping the history of baseball, but not so much of keeping the history of the hall itself. We only got partway through his career that day and sadly didn't make it back to capture his oral recording of the rest of his story. Cliff's CLL caught up with him, caught up with him again in 2010. And he passed shortly after we finished the clean out of his home in Cooperstown that Ed and I now own and visit every summer. And it was also just before the Sabre convention that he had intended to go to. Cliff expressly told us he didn't want a funeral. But Jerry and I and our family celebrated anyway. We asked people from our community in Illinois to join us to please dress casually and wear a baseball cap or a baseball shirt. My daughter wrote in her Facebook post, in a family brought up in the church of baseball, we put on our Sunday best to celebrate a life. My daughters are wearing the actual jerseys from one of the all-star Cracker Jack old timers games that was part of Cliff's collection. Sandy Koufax wore the National League jersey. We served popcorn and soda and we added the hot dogs and Cracker Jacks that we didn't get when we were kids. It made us smile. Our guest logs were scorecards from the Hall of Fame games that dad had commissioned me to design when I was an undergraduate design student at Rochester Institute of Technology. And we all told stories on him, starting with Roland Heeman from the Arizona Diamondbacks via cell phone. And of course, we all sang, take me out to the ball game. In the obituary for Cliff Cackline posted by Chuck in Dugout Central, he asked, quote, with all the accomplishments, all of his accomplishments at TSN, Sabre and the Hall of Fame, the question now becomes, why wasn't he already elected to the Hall of Fame? We wondered that too. And so we made a Hall of Fame plaque for him and made sure to use dad's concise writing style. Alas, it's only inkjet printed and not bronze, but it is mounted in a frame that was used in many induction ceremonies and acquired by Cliff after its usage was discontinued and the frame was discarded. That makes me smile too. Cliff leaves a living legacy two daughters who both had very successful careers in education and business, Jerry in global strategy and programs, and Joyce, me, an innovator and an educator with a passion to empower people through good design, four grandchildren who are a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, an operations excellence process analyst, a business transformation professional, and a creator slash videographer slash director slash editor, plus 10 great grandchildren who will go on to achieve their own great successes. One of the most visible and lasting legacies of his tenure at the Baseball Hall of Fame are the inscriptions he prepared for the bronze plaques of newly elected Hall of Fame inductees. It starts with the class of 1969 and my favorite player of all time, Stan Musial. It includes Satchel Paige and Cool Papa Bell, the first players from the National Leagues who were elected to the hall. And others that true baseball nuts like my dad and millions of fans won't ever forget. In total, his words are cast in bronze 
on 70 plaques in the Hall of Fame. That's a pretty darn good legacy. Happy 100th birthday, Dad. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Joyce. That was terrific. Um, so we, we can do a couple things here. We got a couple questions down in the chat. Um, I'll start with a couple of those. And if some you know family and friends want to jump in with a story, uh, just go ahead. Is everybody seeing the screen now with everybody's pictures? So um, can you see the chat questions, Joyce, or you want me to just read them? Uh, let's see. I can pop it open and I can look at it. Let's see. Well, you know, the one just jumped out at me when you were showing the plaque. So um, how would he feel about the Negro Leagues getting recognition? Oh, he loved it. He was really happy for that. He thought, you know, it, it was well past time. He was part of the old timers committee uh, who are the ones who elected the guys from the Negro Leagues into the hall. So not only did he get to vote for the players who had recent re recently retired as a baseball writer, um, he also got was on the old timers committee. And I don't think, I don't know for sure, but I don't think it was all the same people on both. One of you guys might know that better than I do. Okay. Somebody asked, um, what was his favorite topic to research? And also how many books did he own? So <laughs> we were talking about that the other day and trying to figure it out. And I'm gonna let my husband answer that. So hop in here and, and talk about that, Ed. One of the great stories about Cliff's book collection the first time I showed up in Cooperstown and saw it down in his library, I was just amazed. It, I think it must have been three or four thousand books. I, you know, the number really escapes me. But I know, you know, put it this way: in, in Cliff's inevitable ability, I said, oh "My goodness, this must be one of the largest collections of sports books in the country." And he just nonchalantly looked at me and said, "Oh no, I know two or three others that are bigger." Uh, it was the most he had. Uh, first editions, all different sports, all different areas. Um, and I'm very happy to say, I mean, all the first editions and that he sold off, we still got probably three or 400 that we proudly display there in Cooperstown. What happened to most of that collection? Uh, he, sold it. he sold it. They went to uh, Will Money's. It's Will Money, isn't it, who has the books? bookseller in Cooperstown? Yes. Yeah. So he sold off most of his, most of his collection that way. Okay. Um, did he have a favorite topic to research? You know, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Jerry, do you know, did he have a favorite topic to research? I, I don't know. He just, he- Jerry's on mute. Yeah. And then, I don't know if she's talking or not. Okay. Jerry, can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you now. Do you know, did he have a favorite topic that he- Oh, you're too far away from the microphone. Um, Jerry says she does not recognize, realize, I, she doesn't think he had anything in particular that he would call his absolute favorite. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think he just liked everything, it, everything about baseball. You know, I, I didn't say in the presentation that he actually did play baseball when he was in high school, but he wasn't very good. And so, um, you know, the, the actual writing became more of his passion. I think he played basketball too, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He talked about playing basketball in high school. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any memories or stories they want to share? I do. Hi, this is, oh, hi. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. Who was who that? 
Shall I, shall I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead, Perry. Okay. Joyce, I can't tell you how amazing it was to hear you talk about your father because he's the reason that I joined Sabre back in, I think it was 1982 or 83, when there was only one other woman in the New York chapter of, of, who became a good friend, a woman named Barbara Johnstone. But your father actually sought me out. I think he had read something somewhere about the fact that I had just started umpiring baseball and had gotten out of umpire school. And if not for the fact that he wrote something like just a little paragraph about me in the Sabre newsletter, which was a thing at that, you know, they typed it out and mimeographed it and sent it out in envelopes with stamps and everything. And somebody in Japan so, who was also a Sabre member, got a copy of the newsletter and saw what he had written about me, got me an invitation to go umpire major league spring training in Japan. And for several years after that, to go back and make commercials for a life insurance company. So in, in a, a very real way, <laughs> I owe your dad a lot. <laughs> I mean, I mean, seriously, I owe him some, you know, serious swag for for leading me down the path that led to those gigs over in Japan and he was such a great guy you know because back then there were so few women and he he really made a point of making me feel welcome and um, like I belonged when it was actually kind of intimidating to be around all of these you know numbers guys back then it was more about numbers than narrative but um, yeah, he was my my entry into the Saber family, and I just owe him so much for that. And thank you for bringing him back to life. Really well, loved hearing about him. Thank you for sharing that. Love hearing that. That's awesome. This, you know, yeah. I my desire to be a sports writer. I I'm not sure, but I would guess that an awful lot of children aspire to be what their parents were when they are children you know and um of course when i was a kid it just wasn't heard of women being anything more than school teachers you know or secretaries and so his advice to me to find a different career was based on that particular time frame but yes i yeah i i i got that when i heard you tell that story yeah. that yeah, he, you know, he he was probably more protective toward you, but deep in his heart, I think he he was a progressive, you know, and that he recognized that uh, women had as much right to, you know, be a part of baseball in whatever way we want to as as men. And bless him for that, because like I said, he 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 made a big difference in my life. So Let's I thank him for that very much. That's really fabulous. You know, Perry, it, I'll, I'll just do a segue story. When, uh, when Joyce gave this presentation in Cooperstown last summer, um, I had no idea what was in the presentation and then uh, gave a couple of thoughts and things that happened with me with Cliff. Um, you know, when we got back together in 2008, I only got to spend, you know, a, a little bit about a, about a year but he knew about my basketball officiating and my baseball umpiring. And I knew, I found out that he had been the editor of a lot of the uh, naughty, uh, naughty problems, which when we were oh. coming to baseball, the naughty problems book, the really good umpires had that book on top sure. of the book. I mean, it was before there were really good case books. Uh, that's what we used. And I'll, I'll share this with you as an umpire that, uh, when I went to, when I got to go on that tour of the archives, which Joyce had promised me, and I will make the point that Cliff said he didn't know anything about it, but he'd see what he could do. Uh, <laughs> and then it was Tim Wiles who made it happen. And it was a, it was just a great day for me. I mean, when you talk about going to the hall of fame and being in the archives, one of that picture that he picked was, I pulled out Doug Harvey's, um, Doug Harvey's uh, before he went in 2000. Uh -huh but all of the stuff that he had had. I had known Doug for a lot of years and known a lot of the major league umpires through my different connections. And that's what I was looking at. 
Well, if you take that and you, you fast forward it to 2011, we were invited to go to dinner the night before induction because Roll, uh, Roland Heeman was being inducted as the uh, with the Buck O'Neill Lifetime Achievement Award. And if you heard Joyce mentioned that uh, that 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 uh, he had given the eulogy, the first eulogy right. over the phone at our celebration of life. Well, when we found out that Buck was going into the being honored, and he's a longtime Roland. Saber, Roland, Roland. Uh, he was a longtime Saber member. We got to know him, and, and after her dad had passed, we were invited to spend the evening with Roland at the Otis Saga. And I know those of you that may have been there, it's like an arm. I mean, you can't get into the Otis Saga that night. The security, the list to be able to get in, the only people that are in there are the family members and guests of the people that are in the Hall of Fame. So we get this opportunity because of Cliff's longtime relationship with Roland, we get a chance to go into the, into the Otis Saga. We go down to the Hawkeye Bar and Grill. And those of you that are baseball fans and part of baseball, everybody that's part of this group, if you can imagine a kid from St. Louis that's in the, in the Hawkeye Bar and Grill with some of your uh, some of the, the the heroes when you were a kid that are that are just in the old boys club. They're in the they're in the Hawkeye and they don't have to worry about anybody else being there. There's no people asking for autographs. They don't have to be there. They were in a party mode. Roland and Joyce and I had dinner with Doug Harvey and his wife, and I reacquainted with Doug. Also named Joyce. <laughs> Doug Harvey's wife's name is Joyce. Exactly. And, yeah. and as we sat at dinner and we reminisced about, I mean, I, I, I took Doug to the airport. I had breakfast with him one-on-one -on -one before we had, and we hadn't probably seen each other in 18 years, 19 years. So I'm all excited that I get to introduce Joyce to Doug. And what does Doug do, but have a, a, a story about her dad, that the first time that he and his family went to the hall of fame, when he was a young umpire, that Cliff Cackline had taken him under his wing mm -hmm. And showed him around, made him feel special. That it was just, just a, just a great story about her dad. So you fast forward, we go upstairs. I run into Lou Brock, who I also knew personally. Introduce him to Joyce. Lou has a story about Cliff and how he treated him <laughs> as a sports writer in St. Louis. Wow. Not to be done. Bob Costas comes walking down the hallway, and I've known Bob. Bob when Bob had his first job with the Spirits of St. Louis as a broadcaster, we got to know each other. We sat at a table at a big league umpire's wedding, a daughter's wedding. We spent, we hadn't seen each other since then. I introduced Bob to Joyce and his first, all he starts doing is telling a story about Cliff. So <laughs> here I am on one of the greatest days as far as baseball in history that you could imagine. It was just a magical evening. And every person, two Hall of Famers and a future Hall of Famer for sure, I introduced them to my wife. And their first stories when I introduce you is, is stories about Cliff Cackline. You know, oh. Mike, I just want to thank you for doing this. I know that his that, that Cliff's family and friends appreciated you in the chapter. And I, I'll close with this. Saber was his love. I had some great conversations with him. And, and he loved Saber. He took a lot of pride in that three years that he was the executive director and took the membership from 2000 to 6,000. And what it what it meant, which he started while he was in his career at the Hall of Fame, and what you're doing and the expansion and the continuation of this, it would make him really really happy. And the fact that to tell his story and all the things that that were that were predecessors to this, uh, it'd make him very happy. And thanks for doing this. I think that for on behalf of his family and his friends, just a, a great tribute and uh, won't be forgotten. Muted. You're muted, Mike. <laughs> You're muted, Mike. <laughs> I'm that guy. Um, no, it's our it's our pleasure, and I want to thank Bill Bill Dean. You know, bringing this to our attention that um, our, our the original Hall of Fame induction day was going to be his hundredth birthday, and it you know that inspired us to to do this, and it all happened for a reason. And I make you this promise, our chapter will always carry your father's name. Like it's a legacy that will live on forever. So 
we're, we're proud to have that. And especially after, you know, a lot of people probably wonder who, you know, who's this guy that we're named after now everybody will know and everybody will be very proud. So thank you. Any last stories or memories? You go ahead, Steve. You're now you're muted. Joyce, I was going to jump in and just say one funny thing. I'm Kim. I'm Uncle Cliff's um, niece. Hi, Kim. Can you guys hear hear me? Yep. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I just when you brought up basketball. Yes, he did play basketball because my dad played with him. All the boys played, um, and my dad used to say that. Grammy K um, hand sewed a football and that was their Christmas gift. So all the boys went to school and said, people asked them what they got for Christmas and they all said they had a football. <laughs> but it was the same football and it was knitted. <laughs> and it was hand sewn. <laughs> Which typical Pennsylvania Jets style. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then the other funny thing is you kept pointing out because I'm from the fashion world and I'm in New York. So, I'm, but every time you pointed out his big plaid suit it makes me think about the story my dad told about uncle cliff when he sees a good deal he wants to jump on it and there were apparently he wanted these he found these green crocodile leather shoes and they were on such a great price he couldn't resist but to buy them but they were green really green and they were the <laughs> so wrong remember, size too weren't they <laughs> yeah i think they were his perfect size but because of the sale price, he couldn't resist. So I remember my dad hand drawing a card for Uncle Cliff for his birthday with two crocodiles on his feet. <laughs> I won't forget that. <laughs> so anyway, Joy's fantastic presentation. Absolutely adored every minute of it. It was really, really great. Thank you. Um, Steve, you're not muted. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um... I'd just like to meet everyone. My name is Steve Jeremko. I'm new to this uh, this chapter. Um, I wanted to ask. I did ask on the uh, the chat board, but uh, how often are meetings? Um, you know, where do you meet in person? I live in Vestal, which is uh, just outside of Binghamton. Um, so we right now we this is um, our third meeting in the past year. We. We have the unique um, access to the Hall of Fame. So on Saber Day, which is usually first or second week of February, we always have a meeting at the Hall of Fame. Um, and of course, Hall of Fame induction weekend on Sunday after, you know, an hour or two after the inductions, there'll be a meeting down at Tillapaw's Funeral Parlor. Um, so that, that'll be in July. And then we'll, we'll hope to do some more virtual meetings and bring some players on and bring some other unique guests. Um, if everybody, Anybody that's on Facebook, um, we have a page called Saber Cliff Cackline Chapter, Cooperstown, Upstate New York. So I encourage everybody to to go um, and like that because we make all of our announcements on there. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Heather. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm one of the grandchildren. Joyce is actually my mom. So. Well done, mom. Love the presentation. Um, I actually have two stories to share. They're related to baseball. Um, one of them is not mine, so I'll just try. Uh, it's actually my brother-in-law, Matt. Um, Chelsea is my sister, also one of the grand grandchildren. And uh, her husband, Matt, is also an avid baseball fan. Um, grandpa's favorite team was always the Cardinals, the St. Louis Cardinals. And my sister had the audacity to marry a Cubs fan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big Cubs fans. He loved the Cubs. And there was, I, I don't recall what year this was. It was shortly after they were married. Um, he was sitting watching baseball on the couch at my mom's house with grandpa and uh, the Cubs were playing the Diamondbacks. And um, Matt was kept rooting for the Cubs. He kept rooting for the Cubs and he just kept trying to goad grandpa into <laughs> rooting for the Cubs. And he just, <laughs> he just wouldn't do it. God love him. He would not root for the, for the Cubs. It was hilarious. So, you know, Matt basically just came, you know, come on, Cliff, you don't even, you don't even have any skin in the game at this point. It's not like you're an absolute Diamondbacks fan. You could at least root for the Cubs with me. <laughs> Big grandpa's response was, oh, well, you're not rolling behemoth. <laughs> 
Matt at the time didn't know who Roland Heeman was. He's like, Cliff, that's a made up name. <laughs> Cliff, that's not, that's not real. That's just a made up name. You don't know Roland Heeman, it's fine. And grandpa just smiled and kept quiet and refused to root for the Cubs for the rest of the game. <clears throat> I don't know how long it was later, but not too long after my, my sister went to the mail one day, she went, she went to get the mail and she came in and she said, Matt, you've got a letter. Well, who's the letter from? Well, uh, it's from Roland Heeman. <laughs> so good old Roland had written Matt a letter and in the letter it included his resume <laughs> <laughs> and a picture of grandpa and Roland together. And, um, and it was handwritten too. It wasn't, it was, <laughs> it was handwritten. <laughs> it was, it was handwritten. So, um, you know, Matt, Matt thought that that was really, truly exceptional. And, and he got a little piece of history himself. And that's just one of, uh, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, mom, but didn't Matt tell that story at, at grandpa's, at the celebration of life? Yeah. Um, I, I, Paul, Matt's not able to be here tonight. He had a, a, a work, um, work engagement. So he was bummed, but I asked my sister if she was going to share the story and she said no, but I felt like it needed to be done anyways. So. <laughs> well, and then after that, grandpa always addressed him as <clears throat> not Roland. Correct. For the, for the rest of their relationship, he would jokingly refer to his grandson-in-law as not Roland, <laughs> which he loved. Yeah. But Matt did go to the Sabre Convention in Atlanta, and uh, he was Cliff's escort. Yeah. Escort. His bell. Bell. He, yeah, he, car he carried his bags, and <clears throat> Matt did get to meet Roland Heyman there in in Atlanta at the Sabre Convention, which was pretty. <laughs> yeah. The second story that I have, which is one of the stories that I'll just <laughs> never forget, Grandpa was definitely a baseball a walking baseball encyclopedia and being, I was the youngest grandchild at the time and going to their house was just kind of like going on a treasure hunt because there's just constantly new, interesting things that you would find. Um, but one of the most interesting things that they ever found was actually helping him clean out his house after my grandma had passed away um, during those, I think it was the four years where he was going back and forth between my mom's house and my aunt's house. So I, over the course of one summer, um, different members of the family had gone and stayed with him for a week at a time to help him clean out the house. Um, and my task was, you know, um, not a big one. I was going to help clean out his bedroom and his closets and you know, get his shoes and stuff so that they could go to the various places where he would live. And I was helping him clean out his closet. And um, underneath a set of shoes that was many years old, um, <laughs> in the back of his shoe closet, I found this dusty old duffel bag. And I put the duffel bag on the bed. And I was like, Grandpa, what is this? He said, oh, those are yeah, 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 yeah. Don't throw that away. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to throw it away, but let's, what is it, Grandpa? So <laughs> we opened it up and it's the American League and the National League jerseys. And lo and behold, it was actually Sandy Koufax's jersey from the Cracker Jack game. I couldn't tell you what year it was. We never, I don't think we ever actually figured out what it was, but I asked him about it. I was like, oh, these are really cool. Is this a replica? No, that's his jersey. <laughs> Uh -huh. Wow. How does so according to him, he had been in the locker room interviewing the players after the fact. And at the time they would take off their jerseys and they would just throw it in the laundry bin to go and get laundered. And um, you know, my grandfather asked, Well, where where do those go after they're done? And the players were like, I don't know. So, Can I take them? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so he I uh, took a few of the jerseys from the American League and the National League, and one of them was actually Sandy Koufax's jersey. So was in the presentation, uh, my mom had showed a picture of my sister and I. We, much to her, much to some people's dismay, we did actually wear those jerseys to his celebration of life. And we were very, very careful not to get any Cracker Jacks or hot dogs on them. <laughs> 
But in typical Cliff fashion, as a way to honor my grandfather, I will, in full disclosure, tell you that those jerseys are stored in a dusty old duffel bag with some shoes. <laughs> A little, more, a little more respectfully, but still just a wonderful story that I, is probably one of the things that I will always have taken away from that. So thank you very much for the presentation tonight. Mom, you did great. Okay. Any other stories? All right, well, that I guess that'll wrap it up for tonight. Uh, Joyce, thank you, that was terrific. All right, this, this, um, this was recorded and I believe it's gonna go on um, like a YouTube channel on the Sabre page. So um, again, um, go and like our Sabre page, the Sabre Cliff Cocklin, Cooperstown, upstate New York chapter. And uh, you know, we'll post the video there. So thank you everybody. They have one more thing to add here. When you, <laughs> oh, and then maybe my cousins can, can tell me if they've ever heard this before. When you emailed me this week and you said, tell me how to pronounce your dad's name so I say it right. And somebody told you that it rhymed with back nine. I've never heard anybody ever say that before. And I thought, why didn't we figure that one out? Well, the, because that's golf, that's not baseball, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was Bill Dean that did that. Told me that. Great job, Bill. <laughs> awesome. So that, you know that's how we have our name pronounced. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Joyce. <laughs> Thanks everybody thank you. for attending. Thank you. Wonderful. Fabulous. Yeah, that was great. Thanks. thanks, Joyce. It was great. Oh, thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Nancy and Nancy cousins. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know oh, each other, but you're oh, cousins. Yep. Yeah. Well, and it was great to see other family on here, too. It really was fun to see. And friends from Cooperstown, too. Awesome. So, Joyce, I have a technical hey, question hey, for you before you. Um, do I just end the meeting or do I end the recording first? Uh, you'll end the meeting and then the recording will end and it will end up, I'm not sure inside of your Sabre organization how it works out, but they'll send you a link when you when the recording is done. Uh, and they should also give you the chat as well, a, te a, uh, a, a text document with the chat. And I would okay. love for you to send that to me. That would be great if you could do that. Uh, okay. Probably, I, I don't know what kind of deal Sabre has set up with Zoom, but the original recording comes closed captioned from Zoom as well. Uh, but when you upload it to YouTube, they'll probably do the same thing. They'll capture okay. it. All right. Is there a way I can capture this chat before we hang up? No, unfortunately not. Uh, the only thing you can do is screen capture it. Uh, they maybe you might be able to highlight it all, copy it and paste it into a Word document. Uh, but that's about the only way to, that I've ever found to capture it. But it will, it will show up with the recording eventually. Okay. Hopefully. Anyway, does it, does it Auburn? So hopefully that it does there too. All right. I just copied it. So I think I can, I think I can email it to you. All right. You can go ahead and turn the recording off now and it won't it won't finalize process the recording until after we all hang up. But there's some people hanging out that want to talk, I think. 